Hello and welcome everyone to our first TIFMQ webinar. Uh, we're happy that you are joining this session today. I am Verena and next to me is HIFMQ CTO and co-founder and also today's speaker Dominic Obermeier who will present on lightweight and scalable IoT messaging with MQTT. Welcome Dominic, nice to have you here today. Um, we will start the webinar shortly, but before we begin, here are some tips for you. Um, you can, can ask questions during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A tab. The question will be answered either during the session by Ian Scarrett or afterwards by Dominic. And also we are recording the webinar and will upload the whole video with the slides on our YouTube channel where you can watch it again. So. I think, yeah. Are you ready to start, Dominic? Yes, thank you, Verena. So welcome everybody um, to our webinar about lightweight and scalable IoT messaging with MQTT. Before we start right into the content, um, there's a small puzzle for you, a small quiz for you. So this is a chart. And um, yeah, so, so can you guess what you're seeing there? And for our international viewers, um, the, the dot should be like a comma. So we're talking about, um, th these are billions. So 2005 starts with 1 billion and 2018 is almost 4 billion. So what you see in this chart uh, are the people on the internet. This means um, nowadays almost half of the population on earth um, yeah, is connected to the internet. The thing is, when we, when we look at the internet nowadays, the internet does not just consist of people. The internet also does consist of devices and a lot of devices. So basically, Analyst uh, companies say that until 2025, more than 75 billion devices will be connected to the internet. And just for reference, the chart we just saw, which is like this, this nice line um, up to 4 billion people uh, until 2018, is the yellow line below. So it's just for perspective. So even today, we are dealing with a huge amount of devices on the internet. And this, of course, brings challenges. And how to solve these challenges, or at least solve a few parts of these challenges, is something we're going to discuss today. Because the main trend across all industries is IoT and connectivity. So connecting things to the internet, connecting services to the internet, connecting apps to the internet, and of course, connecting humans with all the things I just mentioned. So welcome, my name is Dominic Obermeier. I am the CTO here at HiveMQ. I personally have a background in distributed systems and large scale systems architecture. I am a member of the OASIS MQTT technical committee, which is responsible for delivering the MQT standard and standardizing on it, basically. I'm a book author. I'm the author of The Technical Foundations of the Internet of Things. And I'm a conference speaker and a pro and committee member for German and international IoT conferences. If you're on Twitter, uh, I also tweet there. So um, here on the left, you see my Twitter handle. So feel free to, to follow me and reach out to me directly in case of any questions. Um, speaking about questions, so uh, we, we reserve some time for questions later on. So absolutely feel free to, uh, to ask any questions and I will be very happy to answer them. Okay, so the thing is, web technologies built for humans, web technologies built, for, built in the last 40 years to serve the 4 billion people we just saw um, in the beginning of, of this webinar, these technologies are not suitable for Internet of Things communication and device communication in general. 
you may ask, why is this? So there are different reasons, but the most important reason from my point of view is to get your company out of front page news because you're building unsecure, unsophisticated and unreliable solutions and delivering it to your customers. There are so many examples of Internet of Things devices which um, did not serve the customer well and also did not serve the company well in the end because it did not work as expected. So this is just one example I found interesting. Like, um, yeah, so because what happens is with Internet of Things, if you do use web technologies, then you're prone to attackers, you're prone to, to hackers, to people who want to harm you and your brand. And um, yes, and, and, all, and it's not even efficient communication and it's not even cheap communication. So if you're using the technologies you were used to build um, for like the, the systems you built in the past for IoT communication, this may hurt you in the end. And there are so many examples of companies out there who learn this the hard way. And uh, so the thing is, why, why not learn from, from mistakes of other companies and do it in the right way, um, how, you, how to build like uh, sophisticated solutions today? Because when you think about the Internet of Things, we have a lot of challenges. And yeah, these challenges are sometimes unique to device communication, but sometimes these are not unique to device communication, but is to internet communication generally. If we look at devices we bring to our customers, or even devices we have in our factory, like machines, if, if you're like a, doing industry 4.0 use cases, then you very often deal with um, unreliable communication channels. So if you if you work uh, for a company who builds uh, like moving devices like cars or or any other um, moving things, then you probably know the pain of unreliable communication channels uh, because when things move, then um, yeah they lose connectivity all the time. But even if you are like uh, on the factory floor, on the shop floor. Uh, it could be if you're losing wireless communication that is not as reliable as you want it to be. And this is a huge challenge and this needs to be solved because not everything will work all the time. Also, with the Internet of Things, um, when we connect things to each other, we don't talk about server hardware. We don't even talk about mobile phone hardware, which is pretty powerful nowadays. Very often you're talking about single board computers. We are talking about, um, about very low computing power and we are talking sometimes about very low memory limits. So you need to be very careful um, yeah, what software you're running on these devices because you cannot run any, hard, any software out there. Also low bandwidth and high latency environments are, are for are true for most IoT um, use cases, which means you cannot send a lot of data and if you send data, it may take a long time. Uh, Bidirectional communication is required. Um, let me elaborate on this. So very often you have a use case, you want to collect data from devices like from machines on, your sh on the shop floor or from, from your connected cars and send it to your backend in the cloud for further um, analyzing and and their yeah, processing, but also you want to send data to your machines to basically control them remotely, to, to um, update, update things, update software. And in general, it's a very good idea to, to have a channel directly to your devices and can control them, but in a secure manner. And this is very important. So one of the biggest IoT challenges uh, is security. We won't talk about security that much today because this would be a different webinar. Um, so, but in general, security is one of the most important things. You should think about it first. And this is not a feature. This is basically a fundamental architectural thing you, you need to consider. Um, if this is of interest to you, um, in the last slides, you see some contact data. Uh, you can also reach out to me directly if you want to chat about this but this would be out of scope today. And what is very important, even if we have the 
the environments we, we are just talking about, uh, instantaneous data exchange is extremely important because you want to give, as a company, you want you to give your customers a snappy experience. People are nowadays spoiled to have nearly instantaneous response times, even if you send data across the globe. So, and this is not only true for consumer devices, but this also happens to be true for, for enterprise backend systems nowadays. So this is something you really should take care of. So why not using HTTP? Like with web technologies, just use HTTP for everything. And the short answer is it's not always a good idea. Very often you have HTTP as a protocol in the mix, but uh, this is usually not what you're doing for device communication. Um, so we just, so, so the, this slide I showed about a vendor who had a security issue. This was basically due to, due to putting an HTTP server on a device. Please don't do this. This is really not a good idea. And um, yeah, so HTTP again is a pretty solid protocol. It's, it's been there for a long time. It's text-based, people love it. The web, the human web loves it. The thing is it's text-based, at least the, the older versions of HTTP2 is binary nowadays. But in, in general, this is a super good protocol for the discovery um, of resources and a super good protocol for um, human interaction, but it tends not to be the most efficient for machine communication. So what protocols are out there then? What should, what should we use? So there are diff different things. So XMPP, a classic, uh, also protocol which was used for chat applications um, back in the be beginnings of the 2000s, um, very popular protocol. MQTT, co-op, which um, is, is used especially in, in local networks. And AMQP, which is also an industry standard for as, as a messaging protocol. And so, so these are like the, the four protocols you really should know about um, when connecting things. There are other protocols out there, of course, but these don't seem to have a lot of traction. Okay, but which protocol sh should you choose? Um, in general, it's up to you, of course, we're doing an MQT webinar. Basically, one of the things is if we look at Google Trends, Google Trends is, is a tool provided by Google to see the global search interest for specific topics like technologies. And what we're doing here, we're comparing the interest, the search interest of people searching for this kind of technologies over time. And you see there, MQDT gained a lot of traction internationally and all other um, of these protocols uh, remain in their yeah, specific area where, where they're pretty good, but it's not, uh, but all these protocols are not widely used. So MQDT is nowadays a safe choice if you're not if you if you're not sure what to use, MQDT is uh, is the even conservative choice nowadays because it's a de facto um, IoT communication protocol. Okay, so then let's talk about MQDT a bit. So for people who are new to MQDT, what is MQDT? In a nutshell, it's an IoT messaging protocol with minimal overhead, which is very easy to use is very machine friendly. It's a binary protocol. Uh, it does not care what kind of data you send over it. You can send text messages. You can send binary machine data. You can send um, even large um, telemetry data from your cars, for instance, to the cloud. And basically it doesn't care. You can, some people even build whole file systems with it. So you can do a lot of things with it and save basically anything or send anything with MQTT. And uh, you can even, as a trivia, you can even send up uh, 250 megabyte messages. So you can even push your firmware updates via MQTT to your devices. And it was built from the ground up for unreliable communication, uh, sorry, for reliable communication of unreliable channels like mo mobile networks, like Wi-Fi, and uh, yeah, other very flaky connections. So this is really the core of MQDT. And this is why it's so widely used today, although it was invented in 1999. So it's a, really a granddaddy when it comes to, to IT. It was invented in 1999 for oil pipeline monitoring. And it turns out that today, the challenges we face when connecting things over the internet are exactly the same folks um, had in 1999. 
And this is why one of the reasons why it's so popular because it's, it does one thing extremely well, and this is connecting, uh, connecting things over the internet and send messages in the most efficient way possible. So what are the typical use cases? So you use this for push communication. So it's really when it's important to send data as fast as possible over the globe. For unreliable communication channels, so if you're having uh, a mobile use case or an IoT use case, chances are MQTT is a very good uh, choice. It was built for constraint devices. So, um, and it's a perfect protocol for communication from the back end to your devices. And nowadays it's even used for lightweight backend communication when it comes to microservice communication. This also is getting traction right now because it's so simple to use for developers and it's so robust when it comes to delivering messages over, over um, yeah, unreliable communication channels, which also happens to, to be the, um, the case in cloud environments because in the cloud environments we have today, things are ephemeral which means, um, yes, um, services go up and down, auto scale and, and shrink again. And MQT is a very good protocol also for these kind of communication purposes. And one of the things why MQT so, why it works so well for IoT is because of the publish subscribe mechanism. So people familiar with software architecture may recognize the publish subscribe pattern. So this is not, nothing MQT invented, it's just an implementation of it. Um, and basically, so if you look at the, the picture here, um, what we see is uh, how, the, how our MQT communication works. We have different participants in the communication and the, really the heart of any MQT communication is so-called MQTT broker. The MQTT broker is responsible for distributing messages to all clients. <clears throat> and basically how this works is any application, any client, any IoT device can subscribe to the broker. So it's, it goes to the broker and says, hey, hello broker, I want this kind of data. Please send it to me as soon as it's available. And then the, the broker um, yes, like a, a list of all the devices and what, what kind of data they're interested. And as soon as a data, a data hits the broker, like within a temperature, temperature sensor, we, we see here on the left, when like this temperature sensor would send the data to the broker that um, how, how hot is in the room, then uh, the broker would distribute this to all clients which are interested in this kind of data. And the nice thing is, it's completely bidirectional. This means a device which um, subscribes, which wants to receive data from the broker, can also send data to the broker. And, and it builds upon the TCP IP stack, which is virtually available everywhere in today's world. And uh, the, the cool thing here is, so it, since it builds upon the all the industry standards the web is built on, it's available everywhere, and you can send data in a bi-directional way uh, as, as fast as possible. So, because it uses standing TCP IP connections, um, which is super cool. And, and what you achieve here is you're decoupling your sender and your receiver. And this is a huge deal, basically, because you can scale your application as you want. Um, and if you, if you make changes to, your, to the data, to the applications, to consumers and to producers in your system over time, you don't need to change anything except the services you, yeah, you want to change basically. So, so you completely decouple all communication participants. One thing which is super important uh, there is the new standard MQTT5. It was released uh, more than a year ago. It's the, the new industry standard. It's an, it's an ISO standard. And it's really the, the best IoT protocol out there. So um, a lot of industry players, uh, in, including, including Microsoft, at Cisco, IBM, and a lot of others, also including us, HiveMQ, we were working on, on this uh, new standard and it's built, it has a lot of features which from our point of view is required for building connected car applications, building industry 4.0 applications, 
um, but also building, let's say, consumer electronics applications, because there are so many features put into the protocol without bloating it up. Still remain on scale and need to, so to use for all projects. And we will see in a minute what options you have, but this is very, very important. And afterwards, if you want to learn more about MQ5, um, I will tell you how you get, get the information, how you can get started quickly. Okay, let's talk about tools. What tools are available? So the good thing is, since MQT is an industry standard, there are a lot of tools. There are a lot of vendors also, which is also important. Uh, so, so if you are choosing MQTT as a protocol, uh, this basically means you're also choosing, um, so, so you're, you, you are not locked in to any vendor. And, and this, this makes it very, this is very, a very important point from my um, point of view, because if you're building an application that should last for the next 10 years and even more, you need to make sure that you're relying on an industry standard protocol like the whole industry, the whole industry um, uses. And I will show you some tools which you can use to get started if, you, if you're new to this topic. So of course, HyphenQ, this is a product of ours. HyphenQ is uh, MQTT broker and MQTT connectivity and messaging platform built for enterprise use cases. So having you was really built for, for use cases which are mission critical. And one of our missions is to, or yeah, to ensure that our customers are not, do not have front page news. And uh, having you is used by many critical um, IoT applications today. And um, yeah, chances are you're using it uh, without even knowing um, today if you're um, operating machines, if you're Let's say if you're on the street or if you um, use any mobile applications, chances are you're using HiveMQ already without even knowing. And uh, yeah, so we power some very large Internet of Things deployment with um, up to more than 10 million devices, which are connected to the same broker cluster. And yes, so the, the good news is that there's also an open source community edition available. So while HiveMQ Enterprise is a commercial offering, there is uh, having queue is also available as open source, which I will talk about in a minute. And one of the things is having queue also comes with a powerful extension system, which is very important for enterprise use cases where you already where you do not have a greenfield project, but you need to integrate with other applications and other systems, including security system and stream processing systems. So basically, having having queue is an MQT broker where devices connect and enterprise applications also connect. And usually in, in today's world, we're having you, um, it's usually operated on Kubernetes, on Docker OpenShift, but also other platforms. And yeah, basically all cloud platforms, including private data centers are supported and can be used with having you. Having you also comes with a community edition. This is a full featured and lightweight MQTT broker for Java which also comes with the, the plugin system and uh, the extension system we have here allows you to yeah, modify basically anything you want on the broker so you can tailor it exactly for a use case. It's an ideal um, project for edge devices, for Java applications. It's completely free. It's under the Apache 2 license, which means you can also use this commercially and it's the foundation of our having the enterprise offering. So this is completely free of charge. The code is available and you can, you can basically use it for whatever, for whatever you want. Um, of course, this is very true. You don't have all the, the features you probably need for enterprise environments. Um, if you have some, some um, compliance or, and, and governance um, rules you need to comply to, then uh, probably the enterprise version is, is a better option. But for getting started, the child community edition is, is available. I already told you that there is an extension system and this is extremely critical to have this kind of extension system because you, 
very likely need to integrate other systems. If you're lucky, you can integrate all systems in the world via MQTT, which at some point of time will probably happen. <laughs> but, but no, just kidding. But the thing is, as we, as we know, anybody who is, who is doing IT for long enough knows there is so much legacy software out there which needs to be integrated. So integration is a very important part. And with the extension system, you can integrate everything. You can integrate your custom security systems. You can integrate your legacy applications. You can integrate your databases. So basically, you can integrate anything um, you want as long as you can do, do this with the Java programming language, basically. And since, since IMQT broke is extremely critical and it requires all this on availability, the extension system of Hive Enterprise allows you to also hot reload your extensions. So you can add and remove your extensions at runtime to ensure that none of your clients are affected and in the end your customers are affected uh, as soon as you update parts of your system. And so probably most people probably don't want to program extensions themselves. So this is why we have a marketplace. Having it comes with a marketplace with pre-built extensions. Um, most of them are available as open source. We have also commercial extensions currently available and uh, soon there will also be partner extensions available. So yeah, this is a, really a marketplace where you can get a lot of use cases for free and, and integrate a lot of systems by just adding, um, yeah, installing something from the marketplace. So you don't need to build everything your own, but of course you can. There's also another thing. Um, I talked about the broker, but of course you need software to communicate with the broker. And you have different options here. You have um, the Eclipse Paho project, which is, is also one of the grandfathers of, of open source um, MQT software, which has software for different programming languages available, including um, Java for older versions, for legacy Java versions, you have for, for C, for C++, Go, um, and a lot of other programming languages. Um, which, these are pretty good for starters. And, uh, and another option you have, especially if you want to use MQTT5, which is, from my point of view, mandatory for new projects, um, then there's also the HiveMQ MQT client. It's based on Java. It was developed together with BMW Car IT for use cases which require very efficient uh, code, which require a very, let's say, lightweight um, communication and with low memory and low compute power. So this is ideal for, for embedded devices, but it's also ideal for, for backend devices, which require huge throughput. Which are, because the, the library is extremely fast. So you can send tens of thousands of messages per second with the lowest overhead um, uh, available. And uh, so, it, so a, lot of, a lot of brilliant engineers worked very hard to, to have the most efficient MQT library uh, which is out there today. And it's completely free and it's open source. Uh, and of course you can also, you can use it, you can con contribute to it. It's a real community project. So usually, if you look at MQTT, at MQTT deployments, usually you have um, on the left side, we see here clients, MQTT clients. We use cars just for illustrative examples. This could also be machines um, and, um, and mobile devices. And on the right side, we see backend systems, different backend systems. Um, so on the lower end, you see a backend system which is connected to the MQT broker cluster via MQTT. And on the, on the upper side, you see a backend system which is integrated natively with the HiveMQ extension system. And so you see, you can really use a load balancer, we'll come to this in a minute, any load balancer on the market, on AWS, you can use the, the NLB. You, if you're running on Azure, you can use their load balancer. On Google, you can use their load balancer. Or you can even bring your own local balancer, like an F5 local balancer or a Citrix local balancer. So any local balancer software can be used with HiveMQ together, um, as long as it supports TCP. But this basically uh, every vendor um, does this. And uh, so again, it's in the left side. You see, you see that 
all the devices can communicate together um, and also communicate with the backend system. So you have an extremely, extremely modular architecture. You just need to make sure you have an MQT broker cluster running. And this is what I will show, show you in a minute. So if this was a bit fast, here is for, for illustration. Uh, HivenQ, we at HivenQ, we believe in open source. We find open source very, very important and we are happy to, to contribute to, to the community. And the HivenQ community edition is completely free of charge. It's a first class, full blown, 100% um, with 100% features um, available MQTT broker. It supports MQTT5 to 100%. So you can get even all op optional features and you get an extension framework where you can integrate virtually anything. And we also have an, an Java MQTT client, uh, which allows you to integrate basically any um, Java application which wants to communicate. And we have a commercial offering, which is having your enterprise, which adds a lot of things like a control center, which find, lets you find the needle in the haystack in a large scale production Internet of Things deployment um, with a lot of enterprise security requirements, um, high availability clustering, uh, analytics for operations people to make it easy to operate. And we have also enterprise extensions available, which yeah, basically allow to, to integrate systems uh, and we have like first class integrations for a lot of systems, uh, especially commercial systems. So <clears throat> one question I usually get is, okay, um, I understood that MQTT has like a central communication point uh, where all devices connect to and all backend applications and all services connect to, to distribute data. What if this fails? And basically we're dealing here with a single point of failure. So if you use an MQTT broker, which runs without its high availability, which is shown in a minute, um, you have a single point of failure, which means if this software fails, all your customers will be affected. And this is a huge problem. So if, you, if you're on the shop floor, which means your, your machines cannot communicate anymore, which um, could be that you're basically losing money because you can't produce anything anymore. If you, let's say, have a connected car application, then all your customers lose their connectivity. So you really need to eliminate the single point of failure um, with MQDT, how to do this. And the answer here is, is clustering. Because basically what, so in the diagrams, I showed one broker. I showed one broker instance where all devices connect to. In reality, if you zoom into, you usually um, have multiple MQTT brokers, which form a cluster. And um, so the way we do this is by having a masterless and active active, um, let's say configuration available, which makes it possible for any broker to, um, to communicate with devices. And the cool thing is all your MQT clients can connect to any broker and the system itself makes sure that even if your failures, like hardware failures, fails in your cloud, your data center on Kubernetes, that your customers, your MQT clients are not affected and it reduces the blast radius as much as possible. So basically what you can do here is uh, this is this applies to HivenQ. This is basically why people uh, why people use why all these large um, deployments use HivenQ under the hoods, because you can have a lesser clustering. You can add and remove nodes at runtime without administration, which means you can run it on Kubernetes in an auto scaling fashion. HivenQ scales to ten million connections in a single cluster, and you have zero downtime upgrades. You can upgrade your broker at runtime, even in an automated fashion, again, on Kubernetes. You can do this even without human interaction. So you get the latest and greatest security fixes for basically for free, and you can, you can then, um, yeah, upgrade. Each, each cluster node is autarkic and self-contained. This means there is no, no um, other software involved, like uh, the zookeeper or so. Um, we don't do this. As soon as you spin up a HivenQ instance, it's completely self-contained. It can form a cluster with other nodes and it do not, do, you do not need any other software for 
coordination, which makes it very easy to operate. Um, and this, this is made possible via true masterless node architecture. And basically it's super easy for clients because your MQT clients do not need to assume anything about the backend infrastructure. You can scale up and down without your, your cars, your machine noticing basically, and you can just spin it up and it's really built for availability. So one of the last things I want to mention, this is, this is I think the most popular question I recently got in a lot of um, talks. What about Kafka? So there's also Kafka and Kafka is used a lot and Kafka is loved by a lot of people. Um, so what, what is it with Kafka? And how, how do we see, how do we integrate with Kafka? Or do we even integrate this? Is this, a, is this like a Python Q versus Kafka discussion or how, how does this fit together? So basically Kafka is used, as, uh, it's ideal for stream processing. Kafka is a, Kafka and the Confluent platform, they are amazing for stream processing in the backend um, if you already have this running. Kafka is not a good solution for IoT communication, especially over the internet. So what you usually have, you usually have an MQTT broker in front. And if you're using Kafka in the backend, you integrate Kafka um, with the MQTT broker. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the massive scalability and the high availability and reliability on the MQTT and device side. And you get your, your uh, high throughput, you get your persistent messaging um, on the, on the backend side. While you could also, of course, use HyphenQ because it's also persistent, it's also high, highly scalable, um, a lot of architectures use Kafka nowadays. And we, uh, we basically, HyphenQ loves Kafka. So we, HyphenQ as a connectivity and messaging platform um, connects and integrates seamlessly with Kafka as an event and data streaming platform for seamless and scalable integration of MQT data streams and uh, Kafka data streams basically. And we are verified by Confluent, the creators of Kafka. So this is a first class. So, so HyvenQ runs first class in any Kafka environment. And there's also a lot of cool things to show. Um, so uh, stay tuned for this. I can't announce this yet, but there's a lot of cool thing coming up here. And so basically we have an extension for this, uh, for HiveMQ, you can just install and then you can communicate with Kafka in a very resilient fashion. So um, you can basically use any MQTT um, topics and messages, push it to Kafka and vice versa. So, so by next month, you can also, also enjoy the bi-directional, like in October, you can enjoy the bi-directional um, features. We have extreme throughput, like hundreds of thousands of messages you can stream to Kafka. And, um, and again, we're certified by Confluent, the creators of Kafka. And our customers are using this for live monitoring of messages for Kafka and to really bring together Kafka topics and MQT topics. And one of the things is in a large scale distributed system, what happens if, if parts fail? So we have seen a lot of customers where their Kafka cluster, and especially in Kubernetes environments, where it stopped responding, where it failed, uh, but, they didn't, but they did not want to affect the device communication. And this is why we built the HiveMQ and Kafka integration with back pressure mecha mechanisms and with completely resilience. So this means um, even if Kafka is not available for like for a moment or even for a longer time, HiveMQ still gives a guarantee that the message is not lost. And as soon as, as the whole system like Kafka comes up again, you can then stream again the data back and forth uh, without having your customers noticing a, a downtime. And also the Hyphenq Control Center, which is used for operations, um, also integrates nicely. So you, you get real-time statistics, what's happening. And also the role-based access control integration, which allows for fine-grained permissions on the HiveMQ side, is also is integrated nicely with Kafka. And it's also super simple. Basically, this is how it works. You have your HiveMQ cluster, you have your Kafka, and HiveMQ connects directly and seamlessly with Kafka via the Kafka protocol. So you do not need anything else 
uh, you, you don't need Kafka Connect or whatever. You can just use uh, vanilla Apache Kafka. You can use also Confluent Platform um, or any other vendor uh, which provides you a Kafka. And we integrate with the native Kafka protocol. So you don't, don't have any headaches by, let's say, protocol conversion and so on. Hiving your handles this for you um, without, without, let's say, configuration effort or, or so. Um, if you're interested in this, uh, so so we so the, the nodes itself um, they figure out what Kafka cluster, what Kafka um, node to connect to, and then partitions nicely. So even if you scale your Kafka cluster up and down, or you have your cluster up and down, things still work, and you don't lose any messages at all. So this is super resilient. And uh, Again, I said that you can integrate this nicely with the Hiving View Control Center. Um, so you see in this screenshot, you see, I think, 100,000 messages per second, which we stream to Kafka and, and write to Kafka here to 10 different Kafka brokers. But you can also use this extension to stream to multiple Kafka clusters. So if you like a you know, manufacturing use case, where you have different Kafka clusters um, for, for different data processing, a single hiding queue broker can also stream to multiple Kafka clusters. Okay, so this is this is really like a high uh, the overview I wanted to give you. So what are the next steps for you if this is interesting for you? So first of all, if you are not familiar with MQD5, check out the brand new features and why it's required for state-of-the-art messaging. You will really love what you see. Um, MQD5 again is one of the hottest topics currently. And this is something you really need. I urge you to check this out if you're interested in building next generation of IT communication. When it comes to monitoring and observability. So some people, especially if you're, if you're in the latest stage and you are in production, people wonder, okay, how do I find a needle in the haystack for IT production deployments? And uh, we have, so how to do this? So these are also like next steps, which are extremely important to, to have. And then the cloud native MQT, how do I run large scale deployments on Kubernetes and integrate with other software like Prometheus um, in, in the cloud native ecosystem? So how to do this? This is also a next step, which, which a lot of um, our customers and a lot of users have. And then security, how do I integrate with existing systems like databases, REST APIs, active directories, um, OAuth servers or any custom built security systems, how to do this. So this is also one of the, the things um, which we get asked a lot. And so we are planning to, to provide you a lot of content in the future with, um, with webinars. So we will talk eventually about all the things here. If this is interesting for you now, and this is urgent, please feel free and to reach out to, to me directly and schedule a conversation with me at dominic at hyphenq.com. So um, I'm very happy to, to then discuss your use case and, uh, and see how we can help. We have a lot of material here. We can also send you. Uh, so if this is interesting for you, just reach out um, directly to me and I will make sure that you get all information required so you're successful with your MQT deployments. Okay, so I think now we have some time for questions. So I saw that um, some questions already were in the chat. Mm -hmm. So yes. so here are seven open questions. Ah, okay. Um, so, okay, let me just answer questions um, live. Okay, so we have a question from, from Varun Suresh. Hello, quick question. Will the load balancer be a single point of failure for the Hiven Q cluster? It's a very good question. And the, the short answer is it depends, it could be. Um, if you're doing this in a professional way, no, usually not. It depends on what load balancer you're using. If you're running on a cloud environment, like on an Azure or an AWS, um, these providers make sure that your load balancer is already highly available. So even if they have failures in software or hardware, then um, they will make sure that, that you're not affected or you only have a very small service interruption. If you're, 
an enterprise environment where you have um, your own local lenses, then um, all the best practices apply you have for, for other IT systems. And like this, this, is, a, this is actually a topic which, which would uh, a bit longer to discuss this in detail, but check out, um, so, so usually DNS is also used here for low balancing low balances. So, uh, so um, like if you search for the Google word, word um, global server load balancing might be something to, to look at if you're worried about load balancing, high availability. Okay. Then we have a question from Rakesh Ranjan Chena. How do, you in, how do you integrate Grafana for visualization? Please discuss on this. Very good question. And this is a very important question from my point of view because um, monitoring is key for any production system. And for people not familiar with Grafana, Grafana is a software used for visualizing um, different kinds of software. The good news here is HiveMQ integrates with um, basically uh, Grafana natively via InfluxDB or Prometheus or any other data source you're using for Grafana. Having you comes with more than 1,000 um, metrics you get, so you can really drill down to any specifics and understand like how many clients are connected, how many um, how how many clients are connecting to your system, how many messages are flowing through your system, and you can even use alerts then with Grafana if something, th something doesn't work correctly um, in your deployment. So again, um, we have in the marketplace, we have extensions for Prometheus, we have extensions for InfluxDB, and um, yes, we basically also integrate with a lot of other systems. Um, okay. Then we have a question from um, Bruno Wolf. There's a lot of hype about 5G networks nowadays. How does this relate to MQDT? I understand that for MQDT, high bandwidth and low latency are not mandatory. Are there any advantages or usage scenarios for MQDT with 5G? This is also a very good question and we, we get this asked a lot. So basically 5G, is, is um, on a lower layer than MQTT is. So if you're using 5G and it, it um, promises a lot of advantages, like very low latency, extremely high, high throughput also, and extremely high bandwidth. And um, so just to mention a few of the advantages. And if you're an MQTT user, one of the advantages is, is here that your MQTT communication even gets faster. So, so you basically don't need to care. But think about this, 5G, it depends on what country you're, you're from. But if you're in Germany, um, it, it is not expected soon that we get 5G uh, coverage across whole Germany. And so what, what happens is, although there's 5G, we will also have the, all the old networks um, for a while. And when you switch from 5G like to 4G or 3G, um, then this could be a challenge. And when you're using MQDT, you basically don't need to care, are you using 5G? If yes, cool, your devices are more responsive than before. Um, but even if you go back to 3G, um, no problem at all. You can, so you don't need to change anything on your application. So you're completely, um, so you're completely fit for 5G and uh, you basically don't need to do anything here. Then we got a question from, from Andre uh, Aper. What is the difference between MQDT3 and MQDT5? This is a very good question. And um, so as a small spoiler, we have a webinar coming up. Um, I will show this after the Q&A, when the date is, and how we can sign up for this. So we will discuss this in detail. So there are more than 20 new features. and and improvements you can enjoy with MQDT5. And many of them are really required for industry 4.0 use cases and uh, also for con connected car use cases. It's, it's very important to have these features. And we will discuss this in detail in the next webinar. Um, this is also something, reach out to me directly. Um, I am more than happy to provide resources. We've also written resources on this um, on, our, on our website and also as a small appetizer 
there will be a lot of content on the Hive Q blog. So be sure to, to um, subscribe to our newsletter, which are, we will show a link in a minute. So um, yes, you can, you can then um, also, you, you will get basically all, all the MQ5 articles we are doing um, to directly into your inbox. So um, I'm showing the, I hope you see the slides now, I'm showing the, um, how do you subscribe to a newsletter? Just subscribe to a newsletter and you will get all content in your, into your inbox. Okay. Um, okay, then we have a question from, an, and, uh, from someone who, who wouldn't, does not like to share um, his or her name. First of all, thanks. You mentioned that Hyphen can be updated in place but as I understood, an update from three to four will be like installing a new version, even with losing 3.x data. Did I understood this, this right? Um, this is a good question. So uh, for people not familiar with the HiveMQ versions, HiveMQ 3 is the, the version which, um, which is used in many of the large scale IoT deployments we have, we have today. And um, this is built for MQTT 3. Hiving Q4, however, is the next generation and it's built up from the ground for cloud nativeness and for um, MQDT5. So, and we get a lot of questions like how do we upgrade to three to four? The good thing is we have, we have um, resources for this. So basically Hiving Q4, if you stay in the three and in the four series, you can rolling upgrade. If you're migrating from three to four, this would require an extra manual step. Uh, because this is required because um, MQD5 is now a first class citizen and this is required for ensuring that your device communication still works after this. And um, the cool thing is you don't need to, if you upgrade, you don't need to change your devices. What the only thing you, you uh, can do um, is using MQD5, but you can still use MQD3 with HMQ4. So if you want to upgrade your production cluster, there is a super convenient export functionality in HiveMQ3. So you can basically export all your data and HiveMQ4 has an import functionality. So you can export the data and import it. This is like an, one manual extra, extra step you need to take, but it's also super convenient. Just download all the data you have, import it, and then you're good to go and you can just resume. And uh, most of our customers are experiencing downtimes of only a few minutes. So, um, but as soon as if you're in the four series again, um, you will never have to restart your cluster or, or anything. You can just do a rolling upgrade. This is just for three to four. So, so you do not have any message loss with the, the procedure I just talked about. But we also have technical resources, a blog about this, but it's a super easy process. Also here, reach out to us. Uh, our support team is also very happy to help um, migrate three to four. Okay, um, then answering live. What about MQDT plus Android integrations? Can you mention interesting success case? Um, so there are a lot of success cases for MQDT to Android communications. Uh, I think one of the first one of the first success cases was Facebook. I think in two thousand eleven when they switched their their Facebook Messenger to MQDT. This I think was one of the early success cases but thousands of companies um, are using Android and um, uh, our mobile devices together with, um, with MQDT, but also, um, yeah, Android is also used on devices, it's used it's in cars and machines on, on a lot of IoT devices nowadays. And yeah, the, good, the cool thing here is um, the HiveMQ MQDT library I showed in this webinar it is also, um, it works seamlessly on Android, so you can just use it there. Again, there are a lot of, a lot of use cases um, and a lot of our customers are also using Android there. Um, so this is really a, a standard thing um, to use MQT and Android together. Um, okay, then um, we, Okay, then we have a question from, Ab from Abigosh. 
Do the extensions work in HiveMQ community version? Is it possible to integrate IDM Keycloak with HiveMQ? Um, yes, there are extensions with HiveMQ community edition. Um, I don't believe there is currently a Keycloak um, integration, a native Keycloak integration in the marketplace. But I have heard of people implementing this. So, uh, so basically, you can use the Keycloak Java API and then, then write your own extension. And then you can put it into, into HiveMQ, even with the community edition. So this would be very easy to achieve. And um, also, if you have any questions about this, so um, also our team is, of course, very happy to help about this. But this is a pretty standard use case. If you're a HiveMQ Enterprise customer, we have the HiveMQ Enterprise Security Edition. Uh, sorry, the Ent HiveMQ Enterprise Security Extension, which allows you, without programming, to integrate basically any any um, security system um, which which uses APIs. So. So this is, if, if you're interested in this, also reach out to us. So we are very happy to, to show you how easy it is to integrate Keycloak. Okay, then we have a question from Joachim Nagelmann. What is the different, bet, difference between open source, HiveMQ and Mosquito? Um, basically there are multiple differences. So Mosquito is a broker written in C. Um, it was one of the very first MQT brokers ever written. And it's really used by a lot of hobbyists and, and people uh, yeah, who just want to try, it, um, to try out MQDT. So this is really the standard application for MQDT. Mm. Um, HiveMQ itself, however, is, is a real MQDT engine you're using if you have a, a use case which um, requires you to have high throughput, um, low latency. Uh, if, also, if you're in a Java environment, HiveMQ makes it easy to have extensions, which Mosquito um, is sometimes not as easy because it's written in C. And um, yeah, some of the extensions on GitHub are, are abandoned because there's no vendor behind um, Mosquito. And there is no support available for Mosquito. Uh, so usually, usually what we see is people, people starting with Mosquito. And as soon as, as they have like a real project, they often switch to HiveMQ. Uh, the community edition or the enterprise edition and nowadays we see uh, that people especially familiar in the java space are using having a community edition directly but in general in general if you just want to use plain mqdt you can of course use both and uh, yeah from my point of view both are great pieces of software so so yeah feel feel free what's what suits you better and what works for you better okay so I think we we now um, yeah we're we're at the end. So there are st still a lot of, of questions I see. So 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 please I would really ask you. You can reach out to me directly um, to Dominic at HiveMQ.com. I'm very happy to answer if you have, especially if you're talking, want to do next steps with the company, how and, and want to ensure you have a production ready MQT deployment. Um, we have an upcoming webinar, um, so in October, about MQTT5, why you should upgrade, what are the brand new features, what are the potential pitfalls, and um, yeah, what are, what are the things um, you really need to know. And please make sure to also subscribe to our newsletter. You will get a lot of uh, fresh original content from us directly and uh, especially with regards to MQTT5. And uh, also, if you missed the webinar, uh, if you cannot make it to a follow-up webinar, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, also there will be some cool content there soon. So make sure to also subscribe to YouTube channel so you get fresh content as soon as it's available. And yeah, so thank you, thank you from my side. Thank you, Dominic, for your very interesting webinars. Before you leave, we want to make sure that you please answer our poll so we can, um, yeah, we can get feedback on the webinar. And also, um, tomorrow you will get the follow-up email and just mail, mail me back. And I'm very happy for feedback. And I think Dominic as well. Yeah, sure. So, 
yeah thanks thanks everyone for attending and see you in october yeah thank you everybody bye bye